This is a portable gaming monitor made by a company called Intihale. It's 17 inches, 1080p, IPS, and 240 hertz. So it's a real esports kind of portable gaming monitor. At least you'd think. But after using it for a few months, I still can't figure out who it's for. Now I'll go into why in a little bit, but for now I'm gonna show you some benchmarks, some charts, how it does in terms of like competing with a real standard 24 inch 240 hertz gaming monitor. Starting with the pixel response times, this is how the Intihill does. Now as you can see, there are four overdrive settings ranging from one through four, and the difference between one all the way up to four doesn't really look that different. You could argue that there really isn't much of a difference, but there is, it's just very small. So really, I would just recommend keeping it at four all the time, especially since it doesn't even go close to overshooting. When you compare it to the competition though, it actually holds its own really well. I'm comparing it to the BenQ Zowie XL2546K and the MSI MAG251RX. And as you can see, it actually does probably almost the best, if not slightly worse or just about the same as the MSI. The only real disadvantage it has is that it doesn't have any black frame insertion tech, meaning that if you wanted to get some extra clarity like the BenQ on the right chart, well, it just doesn't exist here. You're gonna have to stick with standard motion pixel response times. Still not bad though, especially for a monitor as portable as this, being that it's extremely small and extremely light. The gaming experience was also extremely familiar to every other 240Hz monitor I've used. We're talking like the input lag being as low as it can get. Now I'm not entirely sure because I'm still trying to get some kind of LDAT and Nvidia doesn't think I exist or trying to get a third party one, but in terms of feel, it feels just like any other 240Hz monitor. Input lag, extremely instant. With that said, I don't think the overall gaming experience is similar to other 240Hz monitors. But one thing I found with it is that with how far I have to push the monitor back so I can use my mouse and keyboard, because there's no kind of stand that's included, I found it being a little too far for my liking. Imagine your standard monitor on your desk how it normally would be. Now, push that back like a foot or a foot and a half even further, and then you have kind of the equivalent screen size in terms of viewing experience that this has. It's much smaller, making it a lot harder to hit heads or even lock onto people. On top of that, because the monitor doesn't have any included mounting hardware, nor did I even know it existed until I started shooting the video, it sits lower, so you're always looking down and sometimes you might even hunch forward a little bit just to see the screen a little bit bigger. And it's really bad for your posture. That's my experience and you know, I subconsciously lean in forward without realizing it and that's just not good long-term. So I would like for there to be some kind of included mounting hardware so you can make it like go to a stand or something. And they do exist. If you go on their website, you can find an iPad-like stand for it, but you really have to find it. It's not in the 1080p monitor section for some reason, which is why I didn't know this thing existed until the day I decided to shoot this video. And if you don't really care about that, then maybe if you have an ITX case like I do, you could mount it on top of that. But again, you can't really bring it too close. It would still have to sit further because of your mouse and keyboard. It also would probably get pretty warm because of the exhaust hitting the monitor. The gaming experience issues don't end there though. Now this one really isn't that big of an issue because most people don't use a black equalizer, but this monitor doesn't have a black equalizer. It does have color profiles called game modes like RTS, FPS, and so on, but it really doesn't do much. It just goes from your standard looking dark game, well in Siege specifically, to a slightly less dark game. It doesn't actually equalize anything. All I think it's doing is increasing the contrast, which I could just do myself by increasing the contrast. It also doesn't have any color vibrance feature, meaning that if you're playing a game like Siege or Modern Warfare in this example, then pretty much everything will be washed out and you can't really distinguish your enemy from their background as easily as monitors that do include that. It's not all doom and gloom for this monitor though. It does do pretty well in terms of color performance. Now I know this isn't really the kind of monitor that you're gonna be doing color work on, but hey, if you need to do it on the go and you're in a LAN tournament or something, well, you can do some of it. It covers 99% of the sRGB color space, 74% of the Adobe RGB color space, and 76% of the DCI-P3 color space. So like I said, it's not really focused towards creators, but if you do want to work on sRGB content, you can. It also is fairly accurate out of the box, having a Delta E of about 5.5 for color accuracy and about 7 for the grayscale, but that's not really bad. I know a lot of people think, oh, anything more than 2 is bad, but if you're not creating content, especially if you're using this monitor, it doesn't really matter. This is perfectly fine if you're just playing games, media consuming, and stuff like that. If you're not doing any kind of professional color work, 
this is a non-issue at all. Well, it doesn't even have wide gamut support, so it doesn't even matter. However, if you are that anal about having the perfect colors, I will leave a color profile in the description like I do with pretty much every monitor review, but calibrating this monitor yields perfect results. We're talking about 0.5 Delta E for color and grayscale. This is as good as it gets. Uniformity is also pretty good. This is about the second best uniformity results I have ever seen, but I would expect something really good from a monitor this small. Usually the bigger you go, the harder it is to have good uniformity, so I would expect nothing less here. Brightness is okay, having a max peak brightness of about 280 nits, so if you have sunlight blaring into your room, it's not that big of an issue unless the sun is like directly hitting the monitor. If the room is bright, you're good. Hitting the monitor, not so good. Contrast is also pretty standard for this kind of monitor. There's no local dimming, there's no mini LED, no OLED, no micro LED, nothing. It's your standard edge lit IPS panel. So nothing really special here, just your standard contrast. Lastly is the viewing angles. Well, it's IPS, so it's good. You can look from any angle, top, bottom, left, right, whatever. There's no angle discoloration. There's a very slight high contrast effect, but overall it's pretty good. Lastly, we're going to have the design and the OSD, but we're going to talk about the OSD first, then talk about the weird design this thing has going on. Apart from the lack of color saturation, it's controlled from this little rocker on the right side of the monitor, which also acts as a quick volume adjust. But if you push it in, you can access the OSD. You got things like your brightness, contrast, eco, DCR, which is your dynamic contrast ratio, which I just recommend keeping off, and sharpness. Then we have your color temp settings, which has the standard cool and warm setting like pretty much every monitor, and user, which lets you adjust your individual RGB values. Then gaming, which again, doesn't really have enough gaming features. All it has is the game mode, which is kind of like the black equalizer that I mentioned earlier, but really doesn't do much. Then you have adaptive sync, this is free sync capable. HDR mode, which the HDR on this monitor is pretty bad. I don't really recommend using it. And overdrive, which I just leave on strong because no matter what happens, the strongest setting doesn't really introduce any overshoot at pretty much every refresh rate. Well, except that 60 hertz, but many games won't be running 1080p at 60 hertz nowadays. Anywho, next we have the OSD setting, which lets you select your language, your OSD position, OSD timeout and transparency, and miscellaneous, which really just doesn't really have much going for it. Lastly, we have the design. The design of the monitor is pretty good construction-wise. The back part of the monitor is made out of metal, and the front is made out of plastic, and it comes with this leather kind of new Nintendo Switch kickstand kind of thing, which also lets you cover the front part of the monitor when you're not using the monitor or you're traveling or things like that. Pretty handy and multi-function. Design-wise, that's pretty much it. In terms of I.O., it has a multi-function and power button combined into one button, an OTG port, a headphone jack, a mini HDMI port, a USB-C display port, and USB-C power. And even though this is the only USB-C port labeled as the power input, all the USB-C ports act as power. So no matter what port you plug it into, you can get power from either the left or the right side. Speaking of power, one weird thing is that I'm not sure if this was just for the review unit, but I was sent two review units because I thought the first one was broken, but apparently it wasn't. It doesn't seem like you're gonna get a power brick with this monitor and you need one to power the monitor. They say you want about 30 watts of power, but it was working totally fine with my iPad's 18 watt power adapter. It's still weird that you need to buy your own adapter after getting the monitor and the monitor's packaging has holes for a power adapter and you don't receive one. I'm not sure if this is how it's going to come to you, but this is how it came to me twice. One with the pre-production unit and one with me thinking that the first one was broken and then them sending me a production unit. Also, before I forget, this is a portable monitor and being that it's portable, it does have speakers. They're not the loudest and they don't sound the greatest, but hey, it does get somewhat loud, like not as loud as smartphone speakers, but decently loud. So in conclusion, should you get this portable 240 hertz gaming monitor? Well, maybe. The only other competitor that I know of to this monitor is made by ASUS under their ROG Strix lineup, and it's $500, but that does have mounting hardware. So if that really does matter to you, then go ahead and get that. Now the mounting hardware pack is like 600, the monitor itself is 500, but you can mount it to whatever you want to. But this one doesn't seem like you can use any VESA mounting hardware. Also, the ASUS probably has things like an actual black equalizer and color vibrance. I'm not sure because I haven't tested one. If you would like me to review that monitor, let me know. But this is $100 cheaper, it's light, 
it's portable, and it's a great monitor. It's not going to replace your standard 240Hz 24-inch monitor, but it is portable, so it's got that going for it. But if it were me, if I was traveling to events or like when I go to my uncle's house because he's a gamer, when I go towards like Thanksgiving and Christmas and stuff like that, I will end up bringing my regular monitors because I just can't stand how far away I have to push it with how small it is. I just end up performing way better with your standard monitor. That's just me. I personally don't mind carrying bigger things. If you do mind, then this will be good for you. For me though, the only real purpose I see fit for this thing is being used as a secondary monitor, at which point it doesn't need to be 240 hertz. It could be 120, 144 hertz. I don't want 60 because that's just sucks to look at, but yeah, you can get other options as a secondary monitor. You could take this if you want to because it's really small to travel with, you know, take it to LAN events, whatever. But I will tell you one thing, it does really work well for PS5s. Being that PS5 does support 120 hertz at 1080p, it works great. Now, I'd really only really recommend using it for like casual gaming if you're playing like Warzone or Fortnite or whatever you play on the PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X. You know, you're probably going to be at a disadvantage compared to something a little bigger you could see unless you can get it closer to you. But for now, it's just going to stay here until I travel. And if I do end up bringing my computer, because I don't really bring it that much anymore, then I'll bring my Zowie or whatever else I want to bring. But yeah, great monitor, good price for it, much cheaper than the Asus variant, but not my kind of thing. Kind of sucks as I thought it would be like when these when this company reached out and said, hey, you want to try our 240 hertz portable monitor? I'm like, hell yeah, because I get a lot of other companies saying, do you want to try our portable monitor? But we're always 60 hertz or OLED 60, which is nice, but I'm a gamer. I don't look at content on my monitors when I travel. I use my phone for that. So if I'm gaming, I want something like this. But after using it, I realize it just isn't my thing. Maybe the Asus might be because it has that actual stand, but let me know if you guys want to see that review. As always, if you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like. If not, leave a dislike. Consider subscribing. Consider supporting me on Patreon because I like money. And as always, have a great day every day. Peace.